Welcome back. This is Chapter 1, Video 2, in which we'll be talking about deductive criteria for evaluating arguments. There are two basic types of criteria for evaluating arguments as successful or unsuccessful. These are deductive and inductive criteria. You may have heard these terms before. We'll see that they have some things in common, but will turn out to be importantly different. And after we uh, speak about inductive criteria in the third video, towards the end of chapter one, uh, we'll actually leave inductive criteria behind and focus entirely on deductive criteria and deductive properties of arguments and sentences. Now, there's an old-fashioned way of making this distinction between deductive and inductive criteria for arguments, and I'd like to just bring that out in the open and then talk briefly about why it's not how we are going to distinguish deductive criteria from inductive criteria. It used to be said that uh, deductive arguments are ones that proceeded from general premises to specific conclusions, whereas inductive arguments were ones that proceeded from specific premises to general conclusions. But this just isn't right. You can have deductively successful arguments that proceed from general to specific, from specific premises to general conclusions, from general premises to general conclusions, or specific premises to specific conclusions. And you can have successful inductive arguments which proceed from specific to general conclusions, but also specific to specific conclusions and the other due combinations as well. So we are not going to distinguish deductive from inductive in terms of the kinds of premises or conclusions. Rather, we're going to make the distinction in terms of the kind and strength of the link between the premises and the conclusion. This is something that's best illustrated, and it may take a little bit of time to see exactly what the distinction is. Let's focus on some actual arguments. We'll call this example argument 1A. All whales are mammals, all mammals are air breathers, therefore all whales are air breathers. Now one vague question we might ask, is this a good argument or a bad argument? Of course, that's not a very good question to ask. We're going to need to be more precise about how we're evaluating this argument. But you may have a sense just looking at it that it's a pretty good argument. What is it though that makes it good? You might notice that all the premises and the conclusion are true. So that could be one good thing about it. That might not be all we want to focus on here, though. Here's a slightly different argument. Call it 1B. All whales are fish. All fish are air breathers. Therefore, all whales are air breathers. This one's slightly different than the previous one. First of all, it has at least one premise that's false. The conclusion is still true, however. Is it a better or worse argument than the previous one? Well, you might notice that it has something in common with the previous one. It's essentially of the same form. We can display the form clearly, and we'll do that in just a minute after we get one more example. This is 1D. Don't worry, I haven't skipped 1C. We'll talk about 1C in a minute. All whales are reptiles. All reptiles are birds. Therefore, all whales are birds. Now, this one may seem a little bit confusing. All three of the claims, both premises and the conclusion, are false. But you might note that there's something good going on with this argument, something right about it. If we were to imagine that the premises were true, that in fact whales were reptiles, and that reptiles were all birds, then wouldn't it have to be the case that all whales are also birds? So in a sense, you might see that there's the same kind of connection between the premises and conclusion that occurred in the previous two arguments. All three of the arguments we are looking at are of the same form. All F are G, all G are H, and all F are H. One of the things that's nice here about the form is, since we don't actually know what we're talking about, what F's and G's and H's are, we don't actually have to worry about whether those claims are actually true or not. We can focus on the connection between the claims. 
suppose all f's are g's, whatever that is, and all those g's are h's, then mustn't it be the case that all f's are h's? So you can see we have exactly the right kind of connection between the two premises, such that if those two premises were true, the conclusion would have to be true as well. This is a property called deductive validity, and in a little bit we'll see our official rigorous definition of deductive validity. But before doing that, let's take another look at these examples. Here are all three of those arguments on the screen at once. On a grid, the two across the top have true conclusions. The one at the bottom right has a false conclusion. The two in the right-hand column have at least one false premise. And the one in the upper left has all the premises true. Note that there's an empty box here. Can you think of a way to fill in the previous form that would result in an instance of that argument that fits in box 1C? That is, an instance of that argument that has all the premises true but the conclusion false. In fact, you can't find an instance of that form that makes all the premises true and the conclusion false. If you think you have, you probably didn't fill in the form of the argument properly. It's not possible for that form to have an argument instance with true premises and a false conclusion. Sure, we could have some false premises and get lucky and have a true conclusion, as in 1b. We can have some false premises and get a false conclusion, as in 1d. But the one thing we can't do is start with true premises and wind up at a false conclusion. Whenever we start with true premises with this argument form, we're going to be forced into box 1a with a true conclusion, whether we're talking about whales, mammals, and air breathers, or some other category terms. If the terms we choose make the premises true, the conclusion will also be true as well. Now here's a different example argument. Some animals are frogs, some animals are tree climbers, therefore some frogs are tree climbers. It happens that all the claims here are true as well, similar to argument 1a, but there's something different here. Even though it's true that some animals are frogs, and true that some animals are tree climbers, does it have to be the case on the basis of just those two claims that some frogs are tree climbers? We can easily imagine a world in which some animals are frogs, first premise true, some animals are tree climbers, second premise true, but contrary to the way the world actually is, that there are no frogs that climb trees. That is, we can easily imagine the premises being true and the conclusion false. So we can see here that there's not quite the proper connection as there was in the case of the previous three arguments. A few more examples might make this clear. Argument 2b, some fish are frogs, some fish are tree climbers, therefore some frogs are tree climbers. It's the same form as the previous argument. It has false premises and a true conclusion. This doesn't show us much because the previous form also admitted false premises and true conclusion and turned out to contain the right sort of connection between premises and conclusion. So let's take a look at a couple more examples. Here's argument 2D. Some fish are frogs, some fish are birds, some frogs are birds. Here we have all the premises false and the conclusion false. Uh, and again this doesn't really help us very much because that's what would happen with the previous form as well. But take a look at this. Some animals are frogs, some animals are birds, Therefore, some frogs are birds. Here we have a case with true premises and a false conclusion. And we can clearly see that this form fails to preserve truth from the premises to the conclusion. We can see clearly that it's possible to have all true premises but a false conclusion. So clearly, there's a failure of the connection between the premises and the conclusion here. 
Here's the form of the previous four examples. Some Fs are Gs, some Fs are Hs, some Gs are Hs. Again, looking at the form actually kind of helps to see that the connection fails. Because whatever the F, Gs, and Hs are, we can see that if some Fs are Gs and some Fs are Hs, it does not have to be the case that some Gs are Hs. It can be, as with argument 2a, where there are tree climbing frogs, although we were able to imagine that there weren't, and it becomes clear when we look at all four of these arguments together that like with form 1, we can have true premises, true conclusion, at least one premise false, true conclusion, and at least one premise false and false conclusion. But what is different here is that we can have instances of form 2 which admit all true premises and a false conclusion. 2c, some animals are frogs, some animals are birds, some frogs are birds, clearly illustrates that there's a failure of connection between the premises and conclusion such that truth preservation is not guaranteed. Now what we've been paying attention to here are actually two different properties. The main one we've been focusing on is deductive validity and invalidity. An argument or argument form is deductively valid if and only if it is not possible for all the premises to be true and the conclusion false. It's deductively invalid if and only if it's not valid. That if with a double F is just a logical shorthand for if and only if. If and only if means that this is how something becomes valid and it's the only way it can be valid. We've also been uh, in the background seeing this notion of soundness. An argument is sound if and only if it is first deductively valid and on top of that, all its premises are true. A sound argument is deductively valid and has true premises. So what does that mean about the truth value of the conclusion of a sound argument? Well, a sound argument must have a true conclusion because its premises are true and being valid, it's not possible for all the premises to be true and the conclusion false so the conclusion of a sound argument must be true as well. Now if we go back and look at the collection of arguments we had before, we can make a little more sense of what's going on. Argument 1a, we have all premises true and the conclusion true. And since we know that 1c is not possible, since we know it's not possible to have true premises and a false conclusion in this argument form, we know that 1a is valid and sound. With argument 1b, even though those premises are both false, we can see that it's not possible for those premises to be true and the conclusion false. So 1b is valid, but since its premises are false, it's not sound. Similarly with 1d, it's valid. Even though all those claims are false, it's not possible for the premises to be true and that conclusion false. Therefore, it is valid. But since the premises are, in fact, false, we have an unsound argument. Again, we have no instance of that form which would fit in box 1C. We can't produce an example which shows true premises and false conclusion. Well, here are the arguments of form 2 again. We could go through and point out that 2A, 2B, and 2D have the same distribution of truth values in their premises and conclusions as 1A, 1B, and 1D, but that doesn't make those arguments valid. In fact, they're invalid, because no matter what the truth value of their claims, there is not the proper connection there. And we can see that there's not the proper connection there by focusing on 2C. We have a counterexample, true premises and a false conclusion. Obviously, in that argument, it's possible to have true premises and a false conclusion. It's also possible in 2a, 2b, and 2d to have true premises and a false conclusion. In fact, the form 2 is invalid, and every instance of that form 
is invalid, even if it just happens to be the case that the premises are true and the conclusion is true as well. Form 1, of course, as you can see in contrast here, is valid. No matter what we put in there, and no matter what the truth values of the premises and conclusion, the one thing that will not happen with Form 1 is all true premises and a false conclusion. It's not possible for that to happen. Therefore, the form is valid, and any instance of that form is also deductively valid. Here, one last time, are the definitions of deductive validity and soundness. That's the end of Chapter 1, Video 2. We will discuss these concepts very thoroughly in class and use many examples to help you understand what's going on here.